Hello and welcome everybody. Today we have the pleasure of watching Bill Swatner, one of our very own, present on a very interesting and very relevant topic. He's going to talk to us about one of our favorite summer ornamental trees, the crepe myrtle, and an insect that is new to the Bear County area that's causing them a little bit of trouble, bark scale. So join me in, in welcoming Bill Swatner. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Uh, I am Bill Swantner, and uh, I have gone through the first detector training offered by the Master Gardener Association. And so we'll be covering a little bit about the history and uh, the, the various varieties of crepe myrtles and taking a look at the bark scale. And so the question is, is crepe myrtle bark scale coming to a tree near you? Um, in the south, crepe myrtle bark scale is being uh, work together with Texas A&M, University of Arkansas, LSU, and the University of Florida. In these pictures here, the people I have worked with on top left, uh, going to right, is Dr. Mang Mang Gu, Dr. Mike Merchant. Dr. Mang Mang Gu is in College Station. Mike Merchant, I think, is up in the Dallas area. Laura Mur Miller and Irfan Vafi. Irfan Vafi is out of Overton. So the first detector, I'll just touch on it briefly. It is an advanced training that if, if you are a, uh, a researcher by nature, it is definitely something to consider. We're sort of citizen scientists. Uh, the people at A&M and Texas Tech and LSU and Arkansas can't be at all places at all times. But we can just as we take our walks in the neighborhood and as we walk through the, the woods. And um, we can observe things and we report them back to uh, Texas A&M. The, uh, the first detector is offered by Dr. Kevin Ong, a PhD, and he is in charge of the Texas Plant Disease and uh, Diagnostic Laboratory. And his part of the uh, first detector training was introducing us to the National Plant Diagnostic Network. And here are some of the things that they do. We, we look for uh, invasive pests and diseases. Crepe myrtle is one of them. Um, uh, oak wilt is another one. Um, Pierce's disease is another one. And these are things that we just kind of look through or look for as we just kind of live our lives in gardening. Nationally, we are part of the Southern Plant Diagnostic Network, which includes the southern part of Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Florida, which is why these groups work together. And the sort of headquarters is out of Florida. We got to hear Dr. Apple, who to me is sort of the, uh, the godfather of uh, oak wilt knowledge in Texas. Absolutely ever have a chance to hear Dr. Apple talk about oak wilt is very much worth it. We got to hear about Pierce's disease from Sheila McBride because it affects uh, the Texas wine grapes. And that's important because if you are a master gardener and you live north, uh, north and northwest of us in the wine country, it is important to have some idea what Pierce's disease looked like so we can be of some value to people who served out as an industry. One that we're currently watching for, we're, we're being cautious about, is the emerald ash borer. It is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And some cities south of Dallas-Fort Worth have quarantined um, uh, ash trees coming out of the Fort Worth area because this little emerald ash borer, which you see a picture of on the right there, is destroying ash trees. But that's something, and actually a citizen scientist found that and reported it to A&M. So the two I work primarily with is uh, Dr. Mang Mang Gu on the left and Dr. Irfa, or almost Dr. Irfan Vafi on the right. This picture is there because they're trying to, trying to explain that as they put um, tape around tree limbs to check for crepe myrtle bark scale, someone said, well, why don't we put it about shoulder height? And so Dr. Mang Mang Gu said, well, my shoulder height is a little different than uh, Professor Vafi's shoulder height. So, Let's start with a, with a little quiz. Is it crepe myrtle with an A or is it crepe myrtle with an E? Give you a couple minutes to come up with an answer and the answer is, well, it depends on where you live. If you live in the North, it's pronounced, it's spelled crepe myrtle with an A. If you live in the South, it is crepe myrtle with an E. Us living in the South, we'll assume that we are correct. 
But throughout my presentation, you will see that I have a spell both ways because both ways has, are, are, are acceptable. So question number two, is a crepe myrtle one word? Is a crepe myrtle two words? Or is a crepe myrtle with a hyphen? And it too is a trick question. Technically, it is either one word or a hyphenated word. And this is an English lesson that I'll bore you with. If you say it's a crepe myrtle tree, then crepe is a modifier for the word myrtle. But myrtle trees are in the Myrtaceae family and crepe myrtles belong to the Lytraceae family. And I'm sure that that will show up on a Jeopardy question one day and you will know the answer. The L is for Magnus von Lagerstam, which was a Swedish botanist. There are similarities between crepe myrtles and uh, in, in the myrtle trees, but they are different enough. Colloquially, we call them a myrtle tree because the leaves are like crinkled little petals. One of the things beautiful about crepe myrtle tree in the bottom right is the beautiful bark that as, it, as it molts, it comes out this multicolor. Originally, it was taken from Asia to England but because of the climate in England, it just didn't work. And so around 1786, 1790, Andre Michaud brought the crepe myrtle tree to South Carolina, where it just took off wondrously. And so here is a, a picture showing you the myrtle tree, the Metrosea family, and that is a bottle bush, whereas crepe myrtles below, and it has to do with uh, fragrant oil producing plants. Whereas crepe myrtles are part of the Lithraceae family, which is a flowering producing plant. And here is simply a picture showing the beautiful uh, flowers, foliage that the, that the crepe myrtles put out. And on the right is that just absolutely stunning bark that happens when it starts to shed its bark. So, Dr. Vafi would remind us that it has been cultivated, uh, crepe myrtles have been cultivated in the United States for over 175 years. And in the South, they are very a common plant in our landscape. It is valued over $46 million in crop sales, which is important because crepe myrtle bark scale does not kill crepe myrtle trees, but it just makes it extremely ugly. And if you happen to own a nursery, uh, it's important that you sell pest-free plants. And so part of our opportunity as master gardeners is to become advisors to nurseries saying, by the way, there is crepe myrtle bark scale in the area. Another beauty about uh, crepe myrtles is they are relatively low maintenance and there are very few pests and we'll cover that in our presentation. Here's basically some of the uh, origins of the crepe myrtles. On the far left is the, the Indian continent. Going up next to our right would be the Mongolian. You see it in Japan, over to the Korean area, and then over to Japan. And each one of these uh, specific species has pluses and minuses to it. In the United States, crepe myrtles grow best in that line that I have superimposed on this map. Uh, the area uh, to the south is where crepe myrtles seem to do the best. All right, so let's go through a few specific ones. Lagostramia indica, it's native to the Himalayas and China, but also down to the Indian continent, which is where it gets the, the uh, name indica. Its name in Chinese, which I will not even try to pronounce, means or is translated that it blooms for 100 days. The Lagostramia india indica can grow anywhere from eight feet to 30 feet. And in the wild, the, fl the flower color is rose to red. But a, backing up, a, a challenge with the Lagostromia indica is that it is susceptible to powdery mildew. Lagostromia flowery is the Japanese crepe myrtle. In its native habitat, it may grow 35 to 50 feet tall, have a 10 to 15 foot spread. It's Flowers are a little smaller than the indica uh, crepe myrtle, but it is less susceptible to uh, the, the powdery mildew, which is why it's one of the reasons they like to crossbreed these. Not only can they change the color, but they can sort of breed out uh, problems like powdery mildew. The Lagostramia subcostata 
is the Chinese crepe myrtle. It is a shrub, a small tree, so they could breed crepe myrtles to grow tall or, or shorter, depending on the, the origin of the crepe myrtle itself. It is uh, known for its bark, which is a brilliant burnt orange. It also grows wild in the mountains of Taiwan. It has pink uh, flowers with purple markings. There's a Lagostramia limi, which is a multi-stem tree. So if we want to grow a, a multi-strain uh, tree, a multi-stem tree with a beautiful bark, a certain type of color that is uh, not susceptible to powdery mildew, we will include this tree into uh, our mix. The flowers are by nature reddish pink in color, and it says it has been used to uh, introduce darker color and shorter sizes. Lagostramia speciosa is a queen's crepe myrtle. It's native to India. Speciosa simply means that it is showy and it grows best farther south. So here's where we get a lot of our crepe myrtles. And I was at the nursery the other day just double checking to make sure I was somewhat accurate. Here you get the cross, and that's what that little X means, that they took the, the Lagostramia fiery and they crossed it with the indica, and this particular one is called the Biloxi. Well, that's what that little X is, is they crossbred these things, much as, as you heard David Rodriguez talk about us growing uh, tomatoes in Texas. We grow them here in San Antonio. We'll grow a field, and then we'll grow it the following year and the following year. It takes years to get these specific uh, colors and heights to grow the way they are because they crossbreed them, and then they have to decide, is this the correct color they're looking for? Is the correct height is looking for? How susceptible is it to the variety of diseases? Is it consistently growing on a basis that it can be marketed? This is, uh, I have this one because this is interesting. This comes from the seeds from Shanghai, China. And it proved to be mildew resistant also. And it is an Arapaho. And it is a cross between the fiery, the indica, and the lily. So here you have three uh, crepe myrtles being blended together to give you this particular one. But it says its flowers nor its bark are of any particular aesthetic value. But it helps with being uh, resistant to powdery mildew. This is a Texas superstar, a Basham's Party Pink. It is a cross between uh, a fiery, which is the Japanese crepe myrtle, and an indica, which is the one we get from, from India. This is a crepe myrtle, uh, Lagostramia indica natchez. Indica seems to be the, the most popular one that crepe myrtles are crossbred with. I was speaking with a representative from the production department in Greenleaf Nurse, the Greenleaf Nursery up in Oklahoma. And he constantly referred to the indica because it seems to be the best on which to, to begin its crossbreeding. I have this one down here because it comes from our National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. Um, it can grow 10 feet tall and 12 feet wide. This is one of the newer things coming out in crepe myrtles, and that is where you have the darker leaves. And I got this picture from the nursery just a couple of days ago. And I got this from Dr. Mang Mang Gu, which shows really where the crepe myrtle is right now. Some people either love it or you hate it. And what they've done here is they have um, bred the bark and the leaves to be dark. So you're not gonna have that contrast in the bark that you might see on a regular crepe myrtle. So the top left, you have the ebony fire with that uh, crimson color. They are beautiful uh, if you go to the nursery and see them in person. A lady right around the corner has some growing. The top right has that black background, the beautiful pink, and then the bottom left is, uh, again, that beautiful black leaves and black uh, bark with the white. It is really quite striking, but if you're a purist, you're not going to like it very much at all. In your crepe myrtles, this is what you want the root flare to look like. Many times, this is what we do. And I remember hearing one of the city arborists saying he came across this. He scraped all the stuff away, so it looked like this. He came back a few days later, and the land crew had covered it back up. These roots, and even the, the oak tree see on the, the, the upper left there, this is what a root flare is supposed to look like really on every tree because that's bark. 
And when we pile up uh, mulch over it or put dirt over it, soil over it, it allows the microbes to sit there and eat at the, at the, at the bark of the tree and, and it can make the tree weaker and more susceptible to disease. So this is a great looking root flare on a crepe myrtle and also on that oak tree in the back left. This is not what we want and we don't want this either. This is what uh, some of the trade call crepe murder. What it does is that when you cut a tree like, and some people do it like that, you know, they just say, well, this is what my grandfather said to do. Well, that doesn't mean your grandfather was right. That's what science is for. Uh, when, the, when these limbs grow out of here, those limbs are going to be inherently weaker. If they grow to be any size at all, then if we have a storm of some substance, those will be the first ones to break. And also, when we wound the tree like that, it can encourage the crepe myrtle bark scale uh, to find a place to, to call home. So, crepe myrtle issues we've had to deal with. And the big one is powdery mildew. And if you've grown up in San Antonio like I have um, 40, 50 years ago, the trees were just covering this. It's just the way it was. And again, that's because they did not do a lot of crossbreeding. They had the crepe myrtles primarily from uh, India. And sometimes if you're looking at it from the street, you might mistake that for crepe myrtle bark scale, but it's really just powdery mildew. And again, part of the reason of crossbreeding between the Japanese and the Chinese and the Indian is to try to get some of these diseases uh, sort of bred out. This is a flea beetle and it enjoys chewing on the uh, crepe myrtle leaves. Also aphids. Aphids seem to love any plant and so aphids will also enjoy their time at the crepe myrtle leaves sort of sucking the life out of it. But this is what we're looking for on the right. On the left is a beautiful crepe myrtle tree. It has multi-stem um, trunk, has a real pretty dark gray, light gray look to it. And on the right is what happened when it becomes infested with crepe myrtle bark scale. As I said, it's not going to kill our barks. It's not going to kill our trees. But if you went to the nursery and you're looking for that tree for Mother's Day, or you're looking for that tree to put in mom's yard, or, you, or you're a new homeowner and you want that beautiful yard, you're not going to want to buy the one on the right, especially if you see little things crawling all over it and you squish and it turns yucky pink. You're not going to want it. And so it's helpful for us as master gardeners, we recognize this because we might be of some service to the nurseries. And I'll show that to you why in a minute. But anyway, this is the female bark scale, and it's actually that size. No, really, it's not. It's a, but that's what it looks like blown up, and it looks gross and disgusting, but here's what it looks like on trees. This is a, actually from the Alamo Cafe. Somebody left their lunch container. With the picture on the right, you see that beautiful bark between the dark and the light, but then you see that stick and all those white dots. That is crepe myrtle bark scale. The picture on the left, you see the beautiful bark and a, going right across the middle of the diagonal is a limb covered in those little scale insects, both male and female. When I took the first detector class last June, um, I actually was not the first one to find it in Bear County. I was the first one to report it. I talked to David Rodriguez about it. He said, well, call John Morrell over Bartlett Tree. So I called John. He said, well, I found it in... Uh, in uh, Almost Park, uh, Alma Heights area. And so I said, well, let me go look. So I couldn't find it. So my wife and I were just taking walks. And the mistake of taking walks with Master Gardener is you start looking for bark scale on crepe myrtle trees. And so on our third walk, we came across this tree at Bronze Station Elementary School. And I took a picture. And here you can see it is those scale insects are very neatly uh, buried in the crack of that tree. This was taken in um, June. Well, the school's out. So I called the school about the end of July and I said, by the way, you got a problem out there. You got a hold of the principal sometime in August. And I don't have that picture. I can't find it. But this tree was completely blackened within four months. And it was the ugliest thing you've ever seen. I have I kind of a newer picture of it, but it started out with as few as these in a few months infested the entire tree. How do you know it's bark scale? The arrow's pointing to that little white thing there, the little uh, 
it looks like jelly thing in the middle. Well, it sounds kind of gross. I don't know if you're watching this at dinner time or not, but you squish it. And when you squish it, it turns red. That means that you killed the mama and all the eggs. Uh, here's another picture. That's how, that's one of the ways you tell if it's bark scale, if it is an active scale insect, is you squish it. Uh, I always use my knife. I'm not up to using my fingers, but I use a knife and I squish it. And when it turns pink, then I know they'll have come across crepe myrtle bark scale. It loves open wounds like this. And you can see that these crate, these are pictures I've taken from around the neighborhood. You can see that it's, it's buried in there. I date mine. So this picture I took on April the 16th because I'm watching a number of trees and telling uh, A&M what I'm finding on how fast it's spreading and how, not only how fast, but how bad it's spreading, how many are multiplying there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this was taken April 16th. This again is that picture from the I-10, uh, Alamo Cafe on I-10. I think I'm gonna go through some pictures here just to get into your mind how easy it is to see this if you're just used to seeing those little white dots on crepe myrtle trees. <clears throat> there again, you see uh, one, two, three, there's actually four. The larger ones that you see quite easily are the female. All right, so I have an arrow drawn. <clears throat> the top arrow is drawn to the male. The male is significantly smaller because it's not carrying an egg sac. The arrow on the bottom is pointing to a female that has yet to be squished. There again, you see two females because of their size. And again, that is where a limb was cut and they found a nice place to sort of lodge and there's any number of insects in there. Here again, again, I'm showing these pictures just to get into your mind. This is what they look like on a tree. There's those little white dots you normally would not pay any attention to, except that I do, and we're eating at a restaurant. I look at the tree in a window, and I say, hey, honey, do you think that's crepe metal bark scale out there? And it gives us something to talk about over dinner. This is a crepe myrtle bark scale that has been uh, squished or invaded by predator animals. Here it is again more crepe myrtle bark scale. And so here you have uh, Dr. Vafi's picture. Of the, the female is on the arrow pointing down and you see again how, how large it is because it is full of eggs. And the smaller one, the arrow's pointing on the bottom to the top is the male. So what the, um, the scale insects do is they, they suck on the phloem right beneath the bark and they're trying to get the nitrogen out of there so they can turn the nitrogen into amino acids. And they can have babies. And by the process, they need to get rid of all that nitrogen they have that they're not using. And so they excrete it, and it becomes this sugary sap, which allows, which attracts this concoction, becomes the place for this sooty mold to grow on. Crape myrtle bark scale was first uh, found in North Texas in 2004 by Dr. Uh, Merchant. You saw his picture at the beginning. It was probably here, but that's when somebody said, uh, called A&M and said, we have this beautiful uh, crape myrtle that has the ugliest uh, bark to it. And Dr. Merchant went out there, took a picture, and this is what, he's, this is what he found. A little bit of trivia on, they originally, they thought that the, the uh, professors, the people who study this for a living, thought it was simply an azalea bark scale that had found a new host. But as they did research, on the left is an azalea bark scale, and on the right is a, uh, a crepe myrtle bark scale. They're different in shape, and there are other things different, but initially they thought it was one and the same insect, but as they studied it more and more, they found that it was truly something completely different. And here are the locations where crepe myrtle bark scale uh, originated. The idea is that it, uh, somebody went back to one of these areas, took a cutting of the plant, and brought it to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and they planted it. And as master gardeners, we know that it's not a good thing to transport things across state lines and sometimes within states because, as I said, they are already quarantining some of the ash trees from Fort Worth because we don't want the emerald uh, boar, sc ash, uh, boar scale brought down here. But somebody brought back some cuttings from one of the uh, places here and brought it, and now we have it. 
So it did come, again, this is the, the very first sighting that uh, Mike Merchant took. At first, they, they weren't quite sure what they had, but then they realized that it was a brand new scale insect introduced into the United States. So this is my map, uh, and this is not complete. I've added to it since then. As I said, uh, John Worrell from Bartlett found it, and, uh, but I, I found it and I reported to a so that they could put us on the map, and I'll show you that in a little bit as having it um on the left does this show up yes okay this is 1604 this is bandera road i first found it um bronze station elementary right here then i found it at this home right here and i thought well you know the one thing they have in common is tetzel road so I start over here at this nursery and I found it. The reason that's significant is right behind that nursery is a nursery. I mean, right behind this, um, this drugstore is a commercial nursery where people buy crepe myrtles. And so I took pictures of what I had and I took it to the nursery and I said, by the way, so that you know, uh, this crepe myrtle bark seal is about a hundred yards from your, from your uh, nursery. Do you know anything about crepe myrtle bark scale? And they didn't. So that was my response as a master gardener, share with them some of the information I had. I had some of it printed out because I wasn't really sure. So the drugstore had it, the bank had it, uh, the bank got torn down, they tore down the roses, but they left the crepe myrtles and one of them is, is infected. Um, it's going down Tetzel Road over here at the house I found it at. It's at the beginning of my subdivision. It's at a multiplex in my subdivision, Bronze Station Elementary. It's down here, Carson Elementary. It's over here at Billy Bob's Strip Center. It's over here where the Bear County Appraisal Office is. Why does that matter? Because right across the street is another nursery. And so again, that's where we as master gardeners, if we're trained in first detectors and we have some idea what crepe myrtle bark scale, we can go to commercial businesses and say, so that you know, about a tenth of a mile from your front door is crepe myrtle bark scale. And so when your crepe myrtles come in, you need to inspect them. And even when they're there, you might want to inspect them from now, from time to time, because the females can't fly, but they can get attached to a bird's foot. And so a bird lands there, the, the female gets attached to it, the bird flies to one of the nurseries, and the insect gets, uh, gets relocated. To the far right over here, that's Alamo Cafe on I-10. Over here is a, this is a Chuck E. Cheese, this is a Chili's. And there's been other places. I just I, I put this map up a few days ago, but since we're forced to be uh, not having face-to-face -face meetings, my exciting evening is going out looking for crepe myrtle bark scale. So here is a map of where it, has, where it has spread. You see, we are down here, the darkest, which means it was reported in 2019. It has not been reported or discovered or found in uh, Comel or Hayes County but it has been found in Austin and the counties up north. And if you notice, it's interesting enough, that's I-35 right there. It's important for us to have some idea what crepe myrtle bark scale is because there's a lot of stories about it. So the story at uh, ABC Tulsa says, invasive species are killing crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles don't, uh, the crepe myrtle bark scale does not kill crepe myrtles. Theoretically, Dr. Vafi says it's possible but practically it doesn't. But the joke in the industry is that your crepe myrtle will be so ugly that you'll want to kill it. <clears throat> but part of our continuing education is to tell people that's not a true story. It will not kill your tree. It will just look very ugly. <clears throat> so here you have on this picture, a, uh, on the top, these are crepe myrtle bark scale eggs that have been eaten by natural predators. And I'll cover that in a little bit. And there is a lady beetle. I think that's actually a lady mealybug. Uh, this is someone else's slide. I think that's a lady uh, a mealybug. And on the bottom, you see there are still some uh, egg sacs still intact. So this is what Mr. Crepe Myrtle Bark Scale looks like. Very small, attractive young man. He can fly, but he is not the one who lays the eggs, but he can, does have to eat, 
and so he can uh, feed on the, the bark and excrete uh, what he needs to. This is a crepe myrtle uh, bark scale in its second stage of development. And this slide comes through us courtesy of LSU. And this is what I had earlier. This is what the female looks like. And she is puffed up and she is full of eggs. The far right is too fuzzy, but the, the three arrows on the left, you can see those are the little eggs that are laid inside the egg sac. And a fascinating thing um, is if you have a good enough magnifying glass, um, you, can, you can dig one of these off of a tree and you can put your magnifying glass and it'll be glowing pink. It's almost like a Superman kryptonite thing. It's glowing pink. And uh, when I went to the entomology advanced training with Wizzy Brown, she gave us a super cool jeweler's microscope. And, and you put on the, the highest uh, power, you can see the eggs inside the female. And that's a cool thing. Not so much when you squish it, but that, that is, to me, that's a cool thing. And here's what they look like under a microscope. A female can have between 60 and 250 eggs. So how can that small uh, tra trail of crepe myrtle bark scale insects I showed you in that one slide take over a crepe myrtle tree? And the tree's about, I'd say, um, 10 feet, 12 feet tall. How can it take it over in a season? Because each female can lay up to 250 eggs. So if you've got 10 females, that's 2,500 eggs. And, and that's only if you only have 10 females. So here is what crepe myrtle bark scale looks like on a tree or on a limb. And it is just absolutely covered. Try to count all the females in there. Multiply it times, just say 100. And that tells you how many possible crepe myrtle insects or scales can take over a tree. They excrete, as I said, they excrete a honeydew. This is from the uh, Beijing Botanical Gardens. And you can see the upper parts of the crepe myrtle scale, uh, crepe myrtle trees. They excrete uh, the, the, what they do not need. And it just attracts this sooty mold uh, black. So what do we do about all that stuff? Well, there are uh, no cultivars that are immune to crepe myrtle bark scale. They, uh, they are non-discriminatory, whether you're from Japan, China, Mongolia, uh, Taiwan, Korea, they don't care. They will love to, uh, to invade your crepe, myrtle scale, your crepe myrtle trees, and the crossbreeding has not yet gotten rid of it. They start, you know, we're, we're a lot of into the flattening of the curve. They start around mid-March, which is why I uh, have a magic marker and I notate on the limb when I saw them so I can better gauge how fast they're growing, how thick they're growing. But they are in the process of growing right now. Some of the places I checked in January, which they're not growing, and compared to where now, it is significant in some places. So if we wanted to get rid of them, we one way is to target them right about now because they're starting to grow and i'll get there dr vafi came up with this trap this, this picture of traps that they set and the the uh as you follow along going to the right those little uptakes tell you when the crepe myrtle insects the scales really start populating if you follow the blue lines down, it happens between the last part of April, beginning part of May. It depends also what part of uh, Texas you're in. And sometimes it depends on the quality of the report. McKinney, Texas, this is, it did not get a, a good recording that year. But Dr. Vafi is saying throughout the, over this three-year period, they seem to come out during the April to May time period. So if we want to try to eliminate them, or if a homeowner says, what do I do about it? What a business says, what do I do about it? We need to get them this time of year. This is a picture of them overwintering. So how do we, how do we take care of it? Here is a picture of the first tree that I saw it in. And you can see some of the, uh, the limbs in there, or, or some of the trunks, are really very dark. And if you can see up in here, these little, these, that's ball moss. And I don't know why, but that is the crispiest ball moss I have ever come across. And it was only on this tree that had the bark scale. There is a, a tree 40 feet to the east 
and it doesn't have that. And the ball moss is like ball moss, but this stuff was super, super crispy. But here are some of the darker limbs in here, some of the darker limbs in here, darker limbs in here. I, I had uh, I talked to the principal, and he said, yeah, if you want to do some work on it, go ahead and work, but understand this is a school. So what I did one evening, um, after listening to talking to Dr. Uh, Vafi about this, was I took some soap and water. Uh, ivory soap in a bucket and I got a brush and I scrubbed as much of that tree as I could and it you could just see the the dark the, the soapy water just turned a dark dark liquid but I couldn't get it all off so even last year when I finally was able to get a lot of it off it still had really kind of an ugly tinge to it and um, but it's interesting because here it's come back and it's back to its normal beautiful gray um and the the new growth here is also beautiful what i did was what i could i cut down the limbs that were bad but i had to bag it you can't cut these things down and throw them in a compost pile you can't put them in your grain can you can't leave them laying out in the yard because those little insects can move the females don't fly but a bird can come along it can be attached to the bird or a larger insect um, can, it can be attached to or the wind picks it up and blows the female around so if you cut this off which you can do you have to bag it immediately so in my truck I had a plastic bag and when I cut a limb I put it in the bag and when I got through with that I disinfected my tools but what they can do is they can use towel star and spray it twice the challenge is with any spray, if that thing is 12 feet up in the air, you need to figure out how you're going to get that spray on those insects 12 feet up in the air. I suppose you can get on a ladder. You have to have possibly have access to a water supply, which the school was not going to give me, or else I have to go up there with some sort of container. So spraying, is, as you know, with, with any insect can be a challenge. What A&M is finding is that if you can get them this time of year, then Merit and Safari is a, is a drench. And what you do is you, you put it where it's a five gallon bucket or one gallon bucket, you mix it as the label says, and you pour it at the base of the tree. Because as the tree comes into its growing in March and April, and those insects start looking for something to eat so they can reproduce, it takes this uh, insecticide into the tree and it has been found uh, to kill them. So that's why it's important to know when they start populating because in August, they're through. And if you put your, your drench down there in August, there's a chance nothing's going to happen because they've already done all their repopulation. They're just kind of relaxing. We want to, and, and the tree is not absorbing as much as it, as it used to. So with the tree uh, putting out new growth this year, really pulling on its reserves, and those insects really starting to reproduce uh, this time of year is when we'd use uh, Merit or Safari. One thing you can use uh, is air pressure. That was more theoretical. I didn't know somebody would actually do it. So at the Alamo Cafe, again, my wife and I were discussing crepe Merle bark scales since there's nothing else going on in the world. I pointed out to the manager who we know. Um, and I said, by the way, you have this insect out there and uh, it won't kill your tree. It'll just not be very pleasant for people as they're eating their tacos to see these, this tree covered in white bugs. And so he said, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell the tree guys. So the tree guys came out and they had an air pressure machine and they blew them off. Well, they also blew off the bark and they had rivet, they had trenches dug in that tree. And I thought, Oh, I looked at that, I thought, they didn't, no, they did, but they did. They had this high pressure power. Well, it's, it's sort of like spraying. You have to spray absolutely every insect off that tree. So after we got through eating, I went out there, looked at the tree. I saw some absolutely ugly bark because of these, these just blown trenches into it. And there's still scraping myrtle insects there because they did not get absolutely every one of them. So that's why the most effective thing commercially uh, would be the drench done this time of year because it's the most effective, but you can spray them. You just have to make sure you get all the insect. If you want to air spray them, you know, that's, uh, go ahead. Or you can just wait until the bark sloughs off and it starts all over again. So natural enemies, the, the Asian lady beetle, uh, and they have done studies on this. The challenge with any time uh, 
you try to bring in a natural enemy is you need to convince the lady beetles to stay where your tree is because they may have a life of their own. Uh, but um, what, what one study that a &M found was that the lady beetles, while they were there, got rid of quite a bit of the, of the scale insects, but they're not going to stay there. The lacewing, which you see on the right, is also a natural enemy. The mealybugs, which you see on that picture, are a natural enemy, and so are some parasitic wasps. And this is a cool thing. I found this over Carson Elementary. That is a mealybug. It looks like a crepe myrtle bark scale because of that little white puffy thing. But, but this, the crepe myrtle bark scale doesn't move like that. That is a mealy insect. That's why it's important to kind of do a couple things. Don't say, I think I found it. You may not have found it. You squish it. If it moves, it's not a female crepe myrtle bark scale. If you squish it and it turns pink, well, <clears throat> that's kind of gross, but you found it. Um, ants. I took this picture over, uh, I think it's a Bronze Station Elementary. Ants love these things. If you've got ants around a tree, they will take care of the crepe myrtle bark scale for you. If you remember the picture, a few pictures back where I said it looks like those are gone, chances are the ants got to them because the ants find these things. And I, I took this picture, I had to wait. The ants were, were very rude, making me wait, but I waited until that ant was on top of that thing and I took a picture of it because those ants will destroy that uh, female bark scale. And so that is what I would tell you about crepe. You have a here are some additional research uh, resources. First detector is what uh, those of us who go through, for, really anybody, but those who went through, uh, those of us who went through the first detector were encouraged to sign up as first detectors. Stop CMBS, a stop crepe myrtle bark scale. They have some resources on there, and that's where I got the pages, and I handed it out to the nursery so they could, um, they could have the information to hand. Here are any number of additional research resources if you wanted to research crepe myrtles by themselves. So you have an idea of where crepe myrtles come from. You have an idea about how we crossbreed them to breed in colors and to breed out, breed out uh, diseases. A challenge that we're having is that little scale insect will make it look incredibly ugly. You can tell it by the, I showed you a whole lot of pictures, so hopefully embrained in your mind is what those insects look like on that beautiful bark. I gave you ways to, uh, to really take care of it. As homeowners, uh, if you catch it early enough, you go out and squish them. At that house where I saw them on a tetzel, um, it was one, I killed it, I went back, it was not there anymore. If you go in and it's taken over the place, you can try to spray it. Otherwise, uh, if, it's, if, you, if you can, you can cut it and throw it away or just let it go and the following year, try to catch it earlier, you look for it. Beginning of February, kind of pay attention to your tree, see what your tree looks like in February. Then you go back in March, you can start comparing, wow, this, this wasn't there last month. Or there's three or four of these things that were not there in March. And that gives you a better idea of what's happening. Squish the little suckers, and you are taken care of. So that is my presentation on crepe myrtles, their origin, their crossbreeding, the insects, and how to take care of them. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you so much, Bill. And now I'd like to present to you all the announcements that I have for this month. Starting off, we are still not doing any face-to-face -face activities. We're hoping that as we move into summer, we'll be able to start those activities back up again. But until then, stay safe. Each month, I've been bringing you up to date on how we're doing as a group towards recertification. And I'm really excited to tell you about the increases that we've had this last month. When it comes to continuing education, where we need six or more hours of CEUs, last month we had about 27% of Master Gardeners who had not turned in any CEUs, and we're down now to about 21%. That's a significant increase. What's really exciting is the other end of the spectrum. Last month, only about 25% of us had met our six CEUs, and now we're up to 44% 
Everybody is doing such a great job of viewing these online opportunities and getting them recorded into VMS. We have about 35% of us that are somewhere, we've gotten at least one, we're just not quite finished with the six. So keep going and I'll let you know next month how well we're doing. There are still a lot of ways to get those CEUs. Um, the gardening uh, series that Molly and David have been doing are great opportunities and will continue on through the summer. Uh, probably not every week, but uh, frequently during the month. These have been wonderful programs. And if you've missed any of them, you can now go to the My Extension 210 uh, YouTube channel and that's where they're hosting all of the recordings of those great programs along with a lot of other great information. It's the programs from Molly and David's gardening seminar that count for CEUs, but there's some other really terrific information that you'll want to take part in. And then also remember that AgriLife Extension has a Gardening 101 class that's free. It's nine chapters. It's a great review of our basic Master Gardener information. And you get one CEU for each of the chapters that you do, meaning you could get up to nine CEUs for that class alone. In addition to those opportunities, remember that you can watch one of the programs from the Bear County Master Gardener YouTube channel. Uh, one per year. You can listen to David for his live lawn and garden show on WOAI 1200. Or if you don't get to watch it live, go to the archives and you can listen to one of those programs. You can get one CEU code a year for uh, listening to that program. And then we have the online Earthkind Landscaping online modules. Uh, there's a variety to choose from. Each of those uh, counts for one CEU, and you can do one each month uh, to attain your CEUs if you like. For these and other opportunities that we identify, watch your leaflet. That's where we'll provide you with the links to all of these great programs, and then don't forget to code them, code 001, and however many hours credit that you receive. When it comes to our volunteer hours, the 30 hours or plus, we've made some modest gains. And considering that we still don't have our face-to-face -face activities, that's still really good news. Um, for those who have not recorded any volunteer hours, last month we were at about 25%, and we're down now to only 21% of you that need to get started on some kind of uh, volunteer hours. At the other end of the spectrum, 58 Master Gardeners have completed their 30 hours now. That brings us up to 28% having completed the 30 hours. Uh, and nearly half of us are somewhere along that road. Uh, so really good numbers considering where we are. For some opportunities to gain uh, volunteer hours, let me remind you that our Scion, which has changed its format, it's now, instead of being a Master Gardener newsletter for Master Gardeners, is now an edu online education publication for the gardeners of Bear County from the Bear County Master Gardeners. Last month, we had two great contributions by some of our members. Uh, Candy Roach submitted an excellent one on backyard snakes to watch out for when we garden. And Muriel Lanford shared some information about the installation of the new landscape she has out in the north part of Bear County. We thank both of those women very much for their contributions. And we hope that some of you will be joining them in writing articles. I'll give you a heads up. For the June Scion, you'll find articles called Neville's Garden Spot from Nora Fellows. I'll give you a hint. Neville is her cat. And we also have are going to have a great publication called the 2020 Victory Gardens. Uh, the Victory Gardens, of course, were from World War II, and there's some similarities into what's going on right now. This was a great contribution by Josie Seelingson, and we thank them so much. Now, we also have some people that have already claimed some spots for the July issue, but we're looking for people for the August, September, and on issues. 
Remember, it's an easy thing to do. You have a choice. You can write about some aspect of your landscape and supply us with some great um, high resolution pictures and we'll put together an article there. Or you can take a topic of your own interest, submit about a page of writing. We'll help you find uh, appropriate pictures and do the formatting and get it ready for publication in the Scion. These are wonderful opportunities for you to not only gain volunteer hours, but reach out to our community members with some great gardening information. If you're interested in doing this, please give me a call. I want to make sure I get the topic that you're going to be writing on so that if you're about to duplicate something that somebody else is already writing on, we can go ahead and make a change right then. Again, information on how to submit an article will always be in the leaflet, so read there. Another opportunity, of course, is helping us um, add to our Speakers Bureau uh, presentation library. Finding a topic, uh, doing about a 45 minute uh, PowerPoint presentation, you can either do the outline for the PowerPoint and we'll find somebody to finish off the PowerPoint or you can do the whole thing yourself. If you're interested in this, contact Anna Vogler and she'll coordinate with you. And then a new opportunity that will be coming up for you in June will to be, become part of our new Facebook team. The board decided to move from a, um, a Facebook group to a Facebook page. And if you're an old hand at Facebook, you already know what I'm talking about. For those of you like me, this was a little bit of an education and so uh, the changes mean we'll have a little more control over the content that we're putting out for the Bear County Gardeners through our website and we're looking for editors and uh, moderators to help us with this. So watch again for the in the leaflet for opportunities for you to serve. These again will count for volunteer hours. In addition to having six CEUs and 30 volunteer hours, you also need credit for two monthly meetings. And that's been a problem if you didn't go to the January and February meetings because we haven't had the opportunity for any other meetings. And now you do. This video that you're watching right now that included Bill's presentation and my announcement counts as attending the May monthly meeting. And so what you need to do is after you finish this video, go to VMS, you'll write the description as May meeting, crepe myrtle and bark scale and code it as 002 instead of the 001 to get your monthly meeting credit. And if you don't see that one live, you'll be able to pick it up through our Bear County Master Gardener YouTube channel. We'll be sending out the link when the recording gets posted. In June, July, and August, we're going to go for live webinars as our June, July, and August monthly meetings. So be sure and watch for those links. We'll be putting them out through the, through the leaflet. Right now, we're reaching out to the speakers that we had scheduled for June, July, and August. If they're willing to do a webinar, we're going to have the same speakers we had before. And if not, we'll be finding substitutes. As soon as we know those speakers or confirm those speakers, we'll let you know. And it'll be a lot like this video, except live. That means during the presentation, you'll be able to ask questions through the chat box and get answers from those great speakers. Having finished the recertification process for next year, um, gaining that maroon blue bonnet are four of our members. We'd like to congratulate Michelle Hobbs, Muriel Lamford, Donna Myers, and Ruth Ray. These four people have now met all requirements and as soon as we can get together, we're going to present them with that maroon blue bonnet pin. Congratulations. Sharing some news and announcements. 
Remember that merchandise sale that we started back in February? We were going to wrap it up in March, then we wrapped it up in April, then everything went offline, and now they've come back online. We've placed our order. They're in the process of printing up all those ball caps and shirts and t-shirts, and hopefully in June, we're going to be able to get them to you. The plan is when they come in, we will let you know through the leaflet when the date is for the curbside pickup. You'll be able to swing through the parking lot and we'll drop it in your, in your uh, car for you and you can head out. So we are making progress on that. Watch the leaflet for when the date and times will be. If you can't make the curbside, just contact one of us at the board and we'll make arrangements to get the, the uh, um, merchandise to you. BCMG scholarships. We extended the deadline for one more month and that one's coming to a close. So again, if you know anybody who is going through a uh, horticulture related um, major at a university, please tell them that they can submit for the, the $2,000 scholarships till the end of the month, May 31st. Finally, let me share with you some of the things that came out of the May board meeting. The first one is, although our uh, BCMG office is still closed and the date for reopening has been pushed back and pushed back, currently it is June 5th that the AgriLife uh, office and the Bear County Master Gardener offices should reopen. That may get pushed back again, but that's where the date is at this time. In meeting with the board, we decided since we are not having face-to-face -face activities, there's not a lot of reason for people to be entering the office. And we want to keep that space as safe as possible for those who do need to be in the office to take care of uh, Master Gardener business. And so when it does open, it's only going to be open for some designated staff and Master Gardeners our office manager, our treasurer, people like that that need access to the computers and the software programs that are there. So if you try to attend or try to visit the office during those modified hours, you're going to find the door locked. If you need something, let's make arrangements beforehand. You can call during those posted business hours and talk to Mike, our office manager, or you can call me and we'll work something out. But don't do a drop by because we're going to be keeping the, the office closed for just a little bit longer. When we go back to face-to-face -face activities, we're going to reassess that strategy and we'll find a way to open that office um, so that it works for everybody. Stay tuned. Watch the leaflet. In addition, we went ahead and with regret, we canceled the June through August brown bag lunch and learns. We're going to give ourselves a few more months and then starting in September, we're going to bring those brown bags back. We don't know if we'll be doing it as um, an online webinar or face-to-face -face or a combination thereof. Uh, but we've got the summer to figure it out. And then exciting news, we're going to guarantee we have a fall cultivate. We're going to do it online. It may be the only time we do it online, but we're going to go for it. So as we get more information on that, we'll be sure to pass it on to you. And that's it for this month. I hope that everybody has enjoyed their spring in the garden. I know we're all getting anxious to be outside and among people again. So when you do, be safe. And I'll see you next month. Bye.